and welcome back. Um, I hope. Uh, I mean, that's that's a that's an excellent point to to end the uh, kind of the 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 teaser for the documentary. I r remind you that that there's a that that the discussion continues in the full documentary uh, if you're if you're interested where this leads uh, this this ended on part two which is the building competencies uh, but there's actually three parts that 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 the documentary uh, focuses on i hope it did not overpower you with its uh, overwhelming complexity of what we are against and i hope it does not lead to paralysis uh, but in fact gives you some sort of, uh, I hope that this event especially uh, gives you uh, that uh, message that despite the overwhelming difficulties ahead, there are ways to function in a complex system and there are ways to move forward uh, and take action. And on that note, I would love to welcome our speakers. We uh, are blessed with some exceptional uh, exceptionally amazing uh, um, presence here today from Dave Snowden, Snowden the founder of uh, and chief scientific officer of uh, Cognitive Edge and the founder of the uh, and the director of the Center for Applied Complexity. Uh, and of, uh, and now I saw that Nora also managed to join us in the in, during the uh, video uh, premiere. And uh, Nora is a, is an award-winning uh, filmmaker, researcher, and writer, uh, and she's the president of the International Bateson Institute. Uh, I think that you have set up your speeches in a way that Dave will now start, and and then Nora continues. Uh, Dave, uh, welcome. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and and uh, blessing us with 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 your your insights. If, um, the floor is yours, I would say. Okay. Um, first, the apologies. I'm doing this from a lounge in Oslo Airport, so um, it may not be the perfect conditions. So I'll do my best here. Right. Yes. Um, secondly, it would be quite nice to see some faces rather than just see initials on names. It helps with the reaction. So let me run through some high level stuff on this. Yeah. First of all, I want to pick up the question of hope, um, which was the final point on the video. Um, and as a good Catholic, well, maybe not quite as good a Catholic as I was when younger, um, to abandon hope is a mortal sin, um, but it doesn't require you to be optimistic. Uh, a good friend of mine, Terry Eagleton, wrote a really brilliant book called Hope Without Optimism. Um, and another related book called Radical Sacrifice, which I think are relevant to what we're talking about today. Because one of the issues in terms of things like climate change is people are going to have to accept, accept a degree of sacrifice in their day to day lives. And that's one of the problems. So if you look at what happened with COVID, people responded with lockdown. They, they responded to approximate threat in actually a way that a lot of people didn't expect. It was quite socially conscious. People did the right thing. Neighbourhoods reinforced discipline. It wasn't half as bad as we thought it would be. But to be honest, we should be doing that on climate change, but that's a distance threat, so people aren't doing it. So we need to acknowledge a few things. This is called realism, which is never fun, but it needs to be taken. Is human beings respond to proximate threats, they don't respond to distant threats. Secondly, it's not, and I think this may or may not be controversial, but I think part of my role is to provoke. Um, Part of the problem with thinking of this in terms of the Enlightenment, and I've always said we need a renaissance, not an Enlightenment, um, because there's a lot in the past which has value. The problem with Enlightenment thinking is you keep thinking you have to throw everything out and start again, and everything is about progress. Yeah? I might actually argue that the ethical progress is, is actually significantly different compared with the 18th century. I disagree with the video on that. If you look at the attitudes to things like capital punishment and a whole variety of other areas, there has been significant progress in society. But we shouldn't assume that that progress continues. So let me do what in Britain is called doom and dire prognostications for a minute, right? Um, the idea of the human, the population will continue to increase at its current rate, but we lies the fact that we're going to see mass heat death extinctions over the next 10 years. So the temperature in significant parts of the world is going to go above 58 degrees for at least two or three hours. Uh, electrical systems will break down catastrophically. So this may well happen in Western Australia or Texas before it happens in Indonesia or India. Um, but a significant amount of the population is going to be dead or refugees out of all proportion to what we're facing at the moment. 
Um, I'm 70 this year. I'm going to see two more plagues in my lifetime, and the next one's likely to be biological. So there are things scoring out in Siberia at the moment to which we've got no natural resistance and we haven't developed antibiotics to handle them. So the level of uncertainty in the world is going to go up quite considerably and the dependency on institutions is going to be challenged. No? As I say, I don't want to give up on hope on this, but I just want us to get a bit more realistic about this in terms of the way it works. We're also past the point at which we don't have to geoengineer. Uh, we all hope to avoid geoengineering, but geoengineering now is, a, is, on, is on the horizon. And the problem with that is we've got hyper-rich billionaires who might just decide to do it because they think they can save the planet. Right? So the last thing I want is Musk deciding to scatter aluminium foil over the earth and one of his rockets, but he might just do it tomorrow. So, you know, there are things we can do on contingency basis. If you look at what our former chief scientist officer talked about in the, um, well, about three years ago, is the science of how to refreeze the poles is known. It's now an engineering problem. If you can actually work on that, you can give yourself an extra 10 minutes breathing space. So coming back to the 10 minutes before the, ice, the iceberg hit from the video, we need a hell of a lot of 10 minutes in order to solve the big problem. And we're not focusing on what we call option, increasing options. We're trying to solve the big problem rather than focusing more on things which give us more options in the short term. So I'll make that as a general set of points and then come back to our work and I'll do this, you know, now Nora's here, I can hand over to her as well shortly. Um, we take a natural science approach to social systems. Um, so if I'm quite honest about it, I think we need less integration between current social science and natural science. And I think we need transformation in social science. Um, my background is theoretical physics and philosophy, so I sit in both camps. Um, from a physicist's point of view, no social scientist ever has enough data to form any valid conclusion whatsoever. And I don't see any chance of that changing anytime soon. Um, and also, they basically solve problems based on cases. So they use, and this is going to be a key to the point I'm making and links with the work Nora and I are doing together. Um, social scientists work off inductive logic, which is also how AI works. So it's case-based probability, study the past, project the past, identify patterns in the past, assume they will repeat. Yeah? Now that's all well and good and it has some value, but actually human beings evolved to think abductively, not to think inductively. And that's a really important difference. Every attempt to get AI to replicate human abductive thinking, including Bayesian logic, has actually failed. Because abductive thinking is based on abstractions, on the body, on social interactions, on chemistry, on pheromones. It's hugely complex and we don't make decisions as rational individuals. And our decision models are actually largely body and social, less cognitive. This is Andy Clark and other people's work. So we know that human beings evolved to make decisions in groups and as individuals. We know that our decisions are far more informed by our social interactions and what we hear at a local level than they are by any type of rational process. We also know that we don't see what we don't expect to see. If I look at the famous experiments, um, if you give radiologists a patch of x-rays and ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray you put a picture of a gorilla in plain sight, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule, 83% of radiologists do not see it, even though their eyes physically scan it. And the 17% who do see it come to believe they were wrong when they talked with the 83% who didn't. Again, coming back to Clark and Seth, we're constantly micro-hallucinating based on our own and other people's experience. Those hallucinations are interacting with partial signals from the environment. And the first stable pattern, which seems to fit, we apply. So we're a first fit pattern match decision maker, not a best fit pattern match decision maker. Now that, I'm going to throw some ideas around on this, that also links in with aspects from Deleuzian epistemology. So if you're not familiar with the concepts of assemblage, this is really important to understanding human systems. So I'll, I'll make it really simple. Um, I'm sure there are people here who probably understand it better, but I'll just go on the lowest common denominator for the moment. I tell a story, you tell a story, we like each other's stories. So we tell more stories like that and we listen to stories which are like the ones we like. And the trouble with the internet, this magnifies this hugely. 
So you end up in what is called, the, and this is new materialism, if you want to get this into philosophy, new materialism is absolutely fascinating. There's a point where the pattern of that story interaction is such that the story, and it's, an, it's a strange attractor in complexity theory, it's actually genuinely an attractor mechanism, has a reality which exists independently of the storytellers and creates downwards causation. And this is what populists do. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And my many and various sins, I had to listen to you know, read Trump's tweets every morning for four years and then go on a conference call at 2 p.m. Yeah, with MIT, um, which was a deeply depressing experience. But then he was banned from Twitter and I suffered withdrawal symptoms from righteous indignation um, because I didn't have something to read anymore. Right? But what Trump did brilliantly is he used key phrases in order to maintain an attractor and attract a trope of narrative which people couldn't escape from. Uh, this is what Deleuze and Gattereri say is effectively to territorialize the landscape and you can't expect the territory. So some of our work, and I'll talk about some of the things we're trying to do about this, is to deterritorialize, yeah, actually to break the assemblage structures so that those belief patterns are capable of change. And the trouble is, and this has been a problem with people in climate change and on the left for the last four or five decades, is they think if they make Trump look ridiculous and if they argue rationally, mirac miraculously, it will change things. And actually, it only makes things worse. Yeah, because the negative tropes have evolved with the rational arguments in mind. They've, the counters are already built into it. As I say, we're only scanning two, three, two to three percent of data before we make a decision. And we're matching it with stored patterns, which are collective as well as individual. So you've got to do a hell of a lot of work to change that. Yeah. It's also a problem, and Nora and I will both take this line, I think, that things like inner development goals are actually an absolute disaster because they focus on individual change rather than collective society change. And that's what we call lotus eating. Yeah, because actually that's never going, you, you don't change a system by changing individuals one at a time. You change a system by changing the interactions within the system. Yeah, and then the system attitudes then change. It's the wrong way around. Yeah, so we need to think about changing interactions. Yeah. Um, so I've talked a bit about the cognitive science on there. The other thing is in the complexity theory, um, and this repeats what I just said, interactions matter more than agents. You don't have to worry too much about the agents, but you have to change the interactions. And some of the work we're now doing, and I'll talk briefly about this, and this is about to start in Germany and in the States, and we're really interested to run it in other countries, is to increase micro empathy at a highly local level between people from different political and cultural backgrounds. Um, and I'll give you an example of the first time I did this. This was working in Northern Ireland in the 70s. Um, I was then a Jesuit in training, so that gives you my background. And if anybody doesn't know how bad it was in Northern Ireland, I still remember walking down the Fold Road one night and getting picked up by the Protestant police and asked which of my legs did I want broken first. And when I said I would prefer not to have my legs broken, they heard my accent and realized I was a mainland Catholic, not an Irish Catholic. So I was thrown out of the Land Rover and sort of bruised myself on the street. Now, if the Provo commander had come around that night, I might well have joined. Yeah, it was that level of distress. And we forget just how recent this was. I still remember two nights in a Stardy cell in East Berlin back in the 70s as well, which I will remember for the rest of my life. Yeah, This is proximate to the current generations in terms of the way things work. Now, there were two approaches to solve that problem. One was like the inner development goal stuff. We'll get everybody together in the big room and we'll talk about how wonderful it would be if we all respected each other, if we all loved each other and we stopped throwing petrol bombs at each other. And everybody agreed that would be a good idea. But then they went back on the streets and threw petrol bombs within two or three days. Now, this was wonderfully satirized in one of the greatest comedies to come out of British television in the last 30 years called Dairy Girls, if you haven't seen it. And in episode one of series two, two, the Catholic girls are forced into a peace and reconciliation process with Protestant boys, you know, monitored by, facilitated by a trendy priest, washed over by a cynical nun and a cynical high school teacher. And they have two blackboards. On one blackboard, we have all that we have in common. And on the other, they have all we have which are different. And after four hours, the blackboard with differences is full of things like Protestants keep their toasters in cupboards, Protestants don't like ABBA, and the blackboard with things we have in common has nothing on it. 
I mean, if you ever go to Belfast, you can see it's been recreated in the Ulster Museum. And then there's a massive fight, which also involves the parents, based on a complete misunderstanding. And it's an allegory for what actually happened. You can say it's worth watching, and I can send you a clip if anybody wants. We took a very different approach. We took a couple of Catholics and a Protestant or vice versa, and we dumped them into the slums of Rio de Janeiro for six months on an ecumenical project, and we didn't talk about the troubles. And they discovered pretty fast they had more in common than they realized. And they had a conversation about their differences after they'd learned to understand each other as human beings. And that actually persisted into the Good Friday Agreement because it built relationships which stood over time. And the only way you can to sort of populist propaganda is to make the people who have been people have been told to hate human. If you can make them human, then that's why empathy is a key thing on this. So one of the things we're currently looking at, and this may be actually done with the baccalaureate, we're talking with um, Ollie Pecker on this, he's a long-term friend. Uh, we're actually doing this at the moment in Sheffield shortly. We're doing, we've done it in Ireland, we've done it in Malmö. Is using school children as ethnographers to their community. This is a new type of social science research. It's called distributed ethnography. So children become ethnographers to adults in their own community. They capture stories. It's a quantitative approach, not a qualitative approach. And I'll make that point really, if, if you haven't, if you're not quant, it won't scale and politicians won't pay attention. Yeah, and qual takes too long in that sense. So this is quant, they capture stories, people critically interpret their own stories. It's not interpreted by an algorithm or by an expert, it's interpreted by the person who told the story. Uh, in the literature, this is called epistemic justice or epistemic sovereignty. The right to interpret your own experience is key. We can then look at patterns in that in areas of mixed politics, and we can find narratives indicating problems which are common, for example, to Democrat and Republican. And then we can actually algorithmically allocate teams to work on that problem with small amounts of funding so that they start to work together on something they've already agreed is a common problem. And that's microecological things are the obvious one to go on that things affecting my local community, which damage the soil or whatever. And that builds those relationships. So what we're trying to do in theoretical terms, uh, if you know in a healthy ecosystem, the fungal, the rhizomic fungal roots are critical to the health of tree roots, is we're trying to build the human social inter interaction, which is the equivalent of the rhizomic tree roots, yeah, so that we can connect and link systems which would otherwise be disconnected. Uh, we're also in that, and if anybody wants, I can give you more on this, the stuff we're about to start to do with the NHS and elsewhere, is looking at allocating five or you know, lots of hundred dollar grants rather than one 50 million grant. And if you go to the big development banks, they will tell you they can allocate 50 million, but they can't allocate 50 $100 amounts because they can't audit it. Yeah, and the trouble is we all know that the small amounts would make a bigger difference. So we're now we've finished and completed the theoretical development. We're now in the practical experiment. Whereas if four different roles and roles are more important than people in complexity. So, for example, a priest, a head person, the youngest girl in the school, we're playing with different role combinations. Yeah, can form effectively a consortium. This is a variation of Grameen Banking, by the way. I spent time with Mohammed Yunus thinking about this. How do we scale it? Together with an anonymous agent from the bank, so nobody knows who it is, they can spend $500 without filling out a grant proposal. And then we see what works because they're recording what worked in narrative form. And the rest of the money then follows those successes rather than being grant based. Now, this is critical in terms of changing people's attitudes, but it's also about making small changes, which then lead to build changes, rather than try the big change top down. Yeah. So that's one area we're working in. The other area is the biological process of acceptation. And this is where I'll come back to abstraction. And after this, I'll finish and hand over to Nora. Um, acceptation is, is, is the, this is Gould's work, Stephen Jay Gould. Um, it's where a trait evolves to one function and that under conditions of stress, it accepts, it doesn't add up for something completely different. So the classic examples of this are dinosaurs' feathers evolve for sexual display, 
Uh, one class of dinosaur developed skin flaps under their forelimbs to better display those feathers. Those are small, fast running dinosaurs. They're more prey than predator. They run quickly. They start to glide and that's how we get flight. Yeah, you couldn't get flight because if dinosaurs threw themselves off cliffs in the hope of developing feathers before they landed on the ground, they'd die. Yeah, so it needs to evolve in a different setting for something else. We now know that limb-like structures developed in the sea and it was the, the fishes with limb-like structures which came on the land. It wasn't that fins became limbs, that's too big a jump. Now, the cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved to handle fine grain muscle movements in fingers, it accepts in humans to manage grammar in language. The huge sophistication of grammar is too much to happen in a linear way, it requires a non-linear acceptation. Now the relevance of that to technology is high. In 1945, a Raytheon engineer noticed that a chocolate bar melted in his pocket when he was maintained in the magneto of a radar machine. He realized the significance he put a metal box around the magneto and we got microwave ovens. Yeah, uh, somebody noticed a rather embarrassing side effect on a drug trial of a cardiac drug in, which was done in Merthyr Tidville in Wales, where I come from, uh, reported at the conference in Canada and somebody realized the significance of that, we had Viagra. Uh, we're doing work at the moment to measure placebo effect in drug trials. If anybody's interested in that, that's one of our big research ideas at the moment. Because if you can measure placebo effect, you can actually measure variation in the success of drug trials. So the whole point about this stuff is you need to be able to associate something developed for one purpose to something completely different. And in a crisis such as climate change, that's critical. You don't have time to invent primary technology. You need to repurpose existing technology for completely novel purposes. Yeah? Now, there are three approaches to abduction. One is the American pragmatists, so this is Peirce and Klein yeah, and Dewey, and they talk about hypothesis generation. The second, which is Nora and her father Gregory, uses metaphor to force people to think differently. Our, and all these three are compatible, by the way. Our approach is to shift to abstraction because we know that art and music came before language in human evolution, uh, which is why by the, and it's critical to our innovation. Because what art allows us to do is to move to a high level of abstraction so we disconnect a bit from reality, so we see completely novel connections between things. And that's why we're really concerned about the focus in STEM education, because actually innovation requires the arts, it requires that capability. Now we're actually now seeing, by the way, that if you can sing or play an instrument, your chance of Alzheimer's disease goes down significantly. Yeah. Um, that's actually quite important to start to realize. So our approach on this is to actually break this is a complexity principle. The finer grain the material, the easier it is to recombine and achieve novelty. And the trouble is we deal with big problems which are too coarsely grained. If we deal with lots of micro problems, we can change the system a lot faster. So what we do is we break problems and technologies down into their lowest coherent component we interpret those the same way as our kids do ethnography into high abstraction metadata. And then we throw the metadata combinations together to suggest novel uses of existing technology. And I'll give you the classic example on this. Uh, we were working with the big lighting companies. And I'm totally ashamed of this, by the way. It's an appalling product. But it's making them a lot of money. It's a plastic rock that changes garish colors based on warm water flow and human proximity. It is truly and utterly tasteless, but it was developed based on a technology designed to handle urine saturated staircases in Eindhoven football stadium. Now, if we're going to tackle climate change, that's the sort of innovation we've got to show. And that isn't about trying to make individuals more creative. It's about using technology and connections to link and connect things in novel ways that made people curious and then make them inventive. So we've got to stop thinking it's about attitudes and we've got to start thinking it's more about interactions and the interactions then change the attitudes. Now I could go into a lot more, I could talk about anthro complexity, I could talk about this work, but what I wanted to do is say, look, there are some fundamental principles. Interactions matter more than people. Abstraction is critical to innovation. Granularity is vital if you're gonna make real change. 
And you need to have distributed resource allocation and distributed decision making, not centralized or hierarchical or whatever. You need all those in combinations. And all of that is coming from a very strict natural science perspective. We never ever do case studies. What we do is we start with the natural science, which has been subject to peer review and replicable experiments. We say, what does that teach us about systems? Then we develop methods and tools consistent with that science, and then we test them in practice. Yeah, and that can scale because anything based on cases and the conditions of uncertainty is disastrous. Nobody wants to develop new technique techniques for an uncertain present based on cases brought from a certain past. Yeah. And there's more on this on the way the European Union field guide on how to manage complexity, which the joint publication of my research center with the future systems directorate that's available online and that's how to manage field guide on complexity and crisis management. That's got a lot of this stuff in it anyway. But at that point, I'll stop and hand over to Nora. Let's see. Thank you, Dave. Um, and uh, there was a lot there and there's there's some time left and I thought I would do a little bit of an input, but I think it would be interesting for us to have a little conversation and be able to take some questions um, with the group as well. So I, I want to start um, back where you started with this question of hope. Um, because I think it's not an, an unfamiliar uh, experience in this era to find yourself actually carrying um, some darkness, some sorrow, some despair, some disorientation, um, and the sense that uh, that that you don't. How do you, how do we change this? That's, that it's impossible. If we look at if we look at the situation with Gaza and Israel, or we look at the situation with the environment, and we look back at the history into which the complexity has entangled us into this moment, it feels. Um, Dave, you need to mute. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, it it feels impossible to untangle it. Um, so, so how then, I think, you know, Dave, you spoke about optimism and, and I think I would like to bring something else into that, which is the feeling of morale, the feeling of some kind of fire in your belly that can keep you going. Um, and it's one thing to look at the situation and say, I have no idea what to do with this. And it's another thing to say, but I'm going to keep doing everything I can. Um, and and so uh, for me, one of the big frustrations that I have with a lot of the work out there that calls itself um, either complexity or systemically oriented is that it presumes a, a kind of mechanistic, though, though more complicated response. So if we just had a bigger spreadsheet, we could get all of the contextual relational information in it, right? If we could just get AI to, to calculate all the possibilities, then we would know. Okay, but that's not how um, living systems are, are moving. And the key word here is moving. So whatever the 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 model is whatever the approach is of going into these moments what i think i would like to add to what dave brought is this um nurturing and and enhancing the capacities for being in situations that are moving having responses that are also moving okay to think of information not as static data but as something that is in itself alive. You are alive, the information is alive, the systems we're moving within are alive, and what we're trying to do is actually generate more life, okay? Unfortunately, because there are so many separations and categorizations and blockages of that living process, um, the, the livingness gets um, 
gets disrupted. So uh, I want to remind you of a story that you might have had in in about, I don't know, sometime when you were in your teens and what I would call high school and what many of you would call gymnasium, um, where you were asked to attend to the question, the ethics question of the lifeboat. Remember this? And in the lifeboat question, there are a hundred drowning people in the water and you have a lifeboat that has 50 seats. And the question you are given is how will you choose who to give those 50 seats to? Because if you put all 100 people on the boat, you'll sink it, right? You remember this or some version of it? And most of the time, the students in the class, the first thing they want to do is change the rules. And they're right, okay? But they get told, no, 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 you can't change the rules. Hmm. So what happens at that point is that they start to they start to generate questions that look something like this. OK, should we keep the young people because they have a future or do we keep the old people because they have wisdom? Do we keep the healthy people because they can contribute to society or do we pick the sick people because who are we if we don't? Right now, these questions are all horror stories. They're pushing people into pathways of perceiving possibilities that are actually horrific. Right? Those kids were right when they started by saying, how do we change the rules? And that's what I want really to bring in. And it, it I think, fits in nicely with Dave's notion of, of micro empathy. Okay, how, how might we look at this in another way? Let's say it's, okay, there's 105 people in this room. Let's say it's us. What are we going to do? Well, what I am hoping we are going to do is find a way. Figure out something. And, and that's an interesting question. You spoke earlier about collaboration. And one of the big mistakes that you can make with collaboration is the idea that, well, this person has that skill and this person has that skill and this person's good at this and that person's good at this. So what we're going to do is we're going to form a functioning operative system based on our skills like a big clock. And what I want to suggest is that you crunch that up and throw it away, because what we really need to do is ask another question, which is the question, who can you be when you're with me? Who can I be when I'm with you? That we have these as as living complex creatures, those hundred people in the water are not floating numbers. They're. They're people full of experience and complexity. They have heartbreak. They have strengths. They have weaknesses. They have capacities and ways of learning that they don't even know they have yet. Okay, so the question is not who are you and what do you have to offer? The question is how, how do we bring each other's possibilities out? Okay, so that's a different way of looking both at possibility and at collaboration. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's where this notion of abductive process is really important. OK, so when when abductive process was first brought in by this this guy, Charles Saunders Peirce, he said. This is the only way you get something new into the system. Right, so what what I want to go back to for just a moment is this this way in which living systems ecologies everywhere prefer conservatism they prefer to do the same thing tomorrow that they did yesterday and they prefer that notion of this is who i am in these relationships this is what i eat this is my climate okay this is true for you and me but it's also true for the organisms in a meadow there is a preference for staying the same, for continuation, right? And if that continuation gets changed too much, 
the organisms can't recognize each other and there is a, a, a coming apart, a disaster, right? But if they can't change, if they become too rigid and they can't change, while all the other organisms are changing in a changing world, in a changing system, they also become obsolete. OK, so this question then of how do you bring the new in? Where does the new come from? How does a dandelion become different? And this is why Dave was bringing in examples of evolutionary change, because this is a huge piece of what we should be asking right now. Where does change come from? What do we mean? when we're talking about change. Does the organism change in and of itself? Is that change in, in response and in, in the way that organisms are shaping each other? How am I shaping you? How are you shaping me? What's it possible for us to do together is actually defined in a lot of limitations that are completely nonverbal. They're presumed, we learn them in school. You have to present a kind of identity. You do that with tones of voice, with your clothes, with your hair, with your gestures. And you're signaling a communication that in response gets a kind of communication, all right? Dave was saying, you don't change the parts, you change the interaction. How do we then, to cultivate possibility, how do we then allow for each other to be different, allow for that shift in how we see each other. Who can you be when you're with me? How much complexity can I offer you? Where, who am I when you are in your complexity? Now, it's really tempting because this is messy. It's really tempting to slide right back into, well, what we need is a code of conduct. What we need is to get control of this. What we need is to, you know, identify all the different kinds of trauma we're all feeling and find a way to medicate it, make it go away so that we can fit back into the system that's familiar. OK, and this is where we get into all sorts of trouble with what I would call the double binds of the poly crisis. Right. So there are, are in this poly crisis that we are in, there are environmental issues, um, political issues, technological issues, ecological issues, uh, medical issues, mental health issues, intergenerational educational issues. Right. They're running right the way through our lives, food, etc. And in order to respond, to this this kind of complexity there we must actually begin to recognize that the usual responses are actually creating limitations um so so this is based in our communication it's based in our possibility of being in improvisation together can we do this can we, can you improvise? And, and that's not an easy thing to actually respond to. Um, and so where I feel the, the most, um, probably the most difficult work is, is in recognizing that it's not easy to be in a group of 103 people that are disoriented, that are, um, I mean, there's probably not very many people in this room who don't have some sort of crisis going on in their immediate lives somewhere, whether it's a health crisis or something going on with your kids or your parents or your colleagues or your partner or your finances or your, where you know, it's, it's somewhere we're all holding these pressures that have um, increased from all these different directions. And then the, the response is to fix the individual. There's something wrong with you. So we have to fix you. Um, and, and this response, I think, you know, as Dave was saying, this is why um, I'm, I'm critical of the inner development goals, 
is that if you ask, what is trust? How do we build trust? Well, where? You know, there's a lot of things in this world you shouldn't trust. And a lot of people in this world who, who, if they go around trusting, they're going to be in big trouble. So this question of trust is is not a it's not a it's not a model you can you can link into. It's a it requires attention to the contextual relationships in the moment. Who can you be when you're with me? And then we can talk about courage. Then we can talk about um, what we can bring out in each other. But to tell most people who live on this planet that they should be trusting is actually a violent thing to do. They shouldn't. So not having a capacity to trust is in fact a form of, of capacity to perceive nuanced relationships, okay? Capacity to perceive complexity. If you could perceive nuanced relationships that are creating danger, that's a good thing. If any of us were on the streets in East LA, there's a lot we wouldn't see, right? And if you put me, the California girl, in the middle of the tundra in Finland, I might not see some of the dangers that you would see. I don't know what the rotting ice looks like. I don't know what it means to have 20 below, how that's different than 40 below. I don't really know. So I would say, I'm just gonna trust my coat. And you would look at me like I was out of my mind, right? So this, this version of um, identifying the individual outside of what are the relational possibilities, I think is, is, is mind boggling because it's difficult and you can't necessarily lock it in. On the other hand, this is where possibility sits. OK, in the same place that that the trouble is sitting. So I think one question that I would offer you for today is how to how to not seek an end point for what you think from this position is going to be the perfect solution to your poly crisis, but rather you can cast it, you can cast a vision, but know that you will change it. Right. And if you don't do that, you're going to actually obscure the possibilities that come up for you. OK, I'm going to give you an example of this that came up in my life recently. So and this is so um, this is minor. OK, so uh, keep it small so we can hold it. So I have a 17 year old kid who's an art student. He's my Swedish stepson, and he was struggling in math, getting in all sorts of trouble in math. Now, the the response that we've all been trained as parents to give to that situation is you need to buckle down, do your homework, get a tutor, try harder. Right. And so the the way that this kid, of course, sees that is as a as a failure as a, um, a, a a lack that he hasn't tried hard enough, he hasn't applied himself enough, that we're criticizing who he is as a person, etc. He starts to go into various, you know, peripheral places of diagnosable depression. And then he says, I have depression or I have ADHD because I can't concentrate in math. And he starts, you know, he's part of this generation and they're pulling all these diagnoses out of everywhere. And everybody's got their falling into place. And suddenly I think, OK, well, let's just start from another direction. And I asked his brother's girlfriends if they could help him on Saturdays. So Saturdays we set up the living room and everybody came over and I made lots of food and the kids sat in the living room and they worked on the math. And guess what happened? He started to do much better in math. And it wasn't because he was necessarily getting a tutor. It was because the whole family was there in support of him. 
And then I had to go to New York to launch my book, actually. And I needed help with my 95 year old mother. And I said to him, I'll, I'll pay you, but I need you to watch her on this day. And here's the medications and here's the food. And you would not really imagine that having a day of taking care of the 95 year old grandmother in the house would make a difference to the math grade. But it did. Because in that time, he was perceiving a couple of things. One, what it looks like to take care of somebody else. All right. And he hadn't really had to do that. And he was able to perceive the way that we were giving care to him in a way he hadn't. It wasn't necessarily trying to control. And the other thing that happened was he was with somebody who was facing death. And when you're with somebody who's facing death, you have to think about your life. And that Monday, he went to school with a very different approach to being in math class. Okay? Possibilities. Now, in, in this example, I think you can see that the immediate, um, you know, sort of from the hip knee jerk response in our familiar set of responses to how you deal with a kid not doing well in math is is already there. We, it, you know, and actually to hold back that tide. Is it takes a lot of strength. Right, you have to say to the teachers, say to the other parents, say to everyone, wait, hold on, let's deal with this over here in this way that is completely unproven. It's totally tangential. It doesn't look like it's going to do anything at all. But we'll give him a couple of days with this 95 year old and see how he does on his math test. It doesn't appear to be, you know, we're talking about mycelial process. OK, that's what my that's what's happening. Things are sourcing and moving between different organisms, different contexts, different kinds of communication. That's an ecology of communication. My stepson's ecology of communication in his math class was not an ecology. It was a monocropping. OK, if you think of it in agricultural terms, his his relationship to math did not have the relationships to family, to his picture of his identity, of life in ways that he could actually move in, that he could thrive in, and that he could continue. Um, possibility. So the possibilities are not necessarily where we think we're looking for them, and they don't look like what you think they're going to look like. Um, so I think this is something that Dave and I have both been working on for years is kind of at least trying to express this to to groups like yourselves, that the thing you think you're looking for probably doesn't look like anything you think you're looking for. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> and 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 what does that mean? Right. And I, so I want to take you back to that lifeboat example. All right. Who can you be? Because if you ask the question, who should live through this? You're asking the questions that are formulated in the same system that is actually destroying those relationships. To begin with. So so I know you're interested in shifting the question. Um, and and that question shifting, though, can be very disorienting. Um, actually, if it's not disorienting, it's likely you haven't done it. And that may or may not be an easy thing to bring into your group. But I think um, I think the alternatives are unthinkable. At this point, so how how we are able to go forward together, how we can commune and how to tend to those possibilities of of how we can be together and allowing that to change will bring about different possibilities, open different pathways. And then it's and then we have to recognize them. 
Um, so I'm going to invite Dave back and you to ask questions. We have about 15 minutes left here, I think. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Nora. Um, thank you, Dave, so much. Uh, I think I think you managed to to achieve quite a lot in a short period of time that we've spent together, uh, broadening our horizons and uh, uh, quite quite expansively expanding our our minds. I think that there might be quite a lot of questions, so I I, I welcome you to please raise your hand or or then type it into the chat. Uh, I'd love to kick us off with one thing that that kind of relates to both uh, both of what uh, uh, both the things that you 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 mentioned. Uh, Dave, you started off by saying that uh, I mean we are observing a, 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 a polarization in society. We're 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 observing kind of much stronger attraction towards the similar, and I and and uh, it feels like like what you say. Uh, that focusing on the interaction and focus uh, 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 triggering change requires us that we should definitely not only stick to what is similar but actually go out and make that that uh, that uh, um, interaction happen with quite quite the polarized um, po quite the other end of the spectrum and on the other side nora you mentioned how change uh, you know, uh, change is not the the com place of comfort for us. So we 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 revert to something that we want to feel is familiar and 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 uh, maybe doesn't cost that much energy. So my question is, in all of this, with that change being in the spotlight, where do we find the energy? Well, first of all, I want to address the thing that is in both of those pieces yeah. there. Um, which is what I heard Dave saying there, um, and is, and I think it ties into what I'm saying too, is that if you try to address these issues that are complex issues head on, um, you will more than likely make them worse. So the 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 difficulty if you have pol polarized groups. What you actually have is complex human beings who have a place where they are polarized. But they also have a whole lot of complexity that they share, but they're not used to to attending to that. So, so what what is revolutionary here is that it's indirect. Okay, so it's very much like the example I gave with my stepson, where the response is not the direct response, and what it invites is a more relational response that comes from the side that's going to pull other things in. Um, but but that's not the world that boards of directors are used to living in. So getting permission to respond in a way that isn't a direct corrective for a first order response is actually quite radical. Um, so So that's how I would say, and I think the energy comes from for me, the energy comes from the fact that it's so beautiful. When you see this shift happen, it's just remarkable and beautiful. Life wants to make more life. And it's so easy to forget that. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I think, I mean, there is a paradox in this, all right? If I look at it, and a lot of our work uses constructor theory from quantum mechanics, such as energy gradients. And there's a general principle on this, whatever has the lowest energy gradient is going to win. This has now been adopted as a new approach to foresight. It's better than scenario planning. You measure the energy gradients of the present, that gives you more predictive capacity. And we've worked on that for about nine years now. Yeah? But if you actually look at an energy gradient perspective on politics, it was the homogenization of left and right into neoliberalism that reduced the energy cost of extremism. So as long as there was a difference between the parties and the left and right that occupied people, then we got rid of those differences. The energy cost of extremism on both sides went down significantly. And there's a key concept here, which we call coherent heterogeneity. In that you need to be able to cohere at the right time. So to give my standard illustration, I'm Welsh. Yeah? Um, that means rugby is a religious matter. We actually sing hymns at rugby matches. We regard it as a religious observance. And I support a highly civilized team called Cardiff, who occasionally have to play these absolute bloody bastards from Clinetley. 
We hate their guts. So we call them Turks because they hijacked the Turkish ship in the 19th century. We never let them forget it. But tomorrow, when the Scots arrive, we're all Welsh, mm. right? And it's that ability, and this is a key concept of, 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 of Gregory, I think, here, which is a difference that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Without differences, without gradients, without anomalies, human beings don't evolve. In fact, we, we don't, unless there's an anomaly, we don't pay attention. So that's one thing, right? I think, well, one sidebar on this, I think if anybody talks about a metacrisis, not a polycrisis, they're trying to gaslight you. And I think that's a problem, yeah, because they're trying to make it a mental problem that they can assist you with rather than the recognition of the scientific nature. It's a poly crisis. It is not a meta crisis. And that's really important. Yeah. And I know that will upset some people, but I do not apologize for it. All right? They need upsetting. Yeah. Now, I think if you look at this, there's a book by McKay called Obliquity, which is a really good book. And it basically gives loads and loads of cases where we discovered other things. We, we were looking for something else. We discovered some things in our peripheral vision. That's key to abduction. There are some exciting things we can do on this. We're looking at two things. Um, one is levee walks, which is how basking sharks and indigenous people hunt when they don't know where the food is. And it's a form of Pareto or scholastic process with randomness in it, which doesn't require a directed intelligence. The same is true of the waggle dance of bees. Now, we've now been working through that theoretically. We're now ready to do the practical experiments in human systems, whereby changing the dynamic of the interaction of things, you increase discovery without the need for intentionality. And if you can remove intentionality from the discovery process, that matches more the sort of accidental nature of discovery we see over time. So I think there's some really exciting things we can do with this. And where Nora started on this, I'm, I'm writing on this at the moment, I think we need to talk about how we incite people. I think incite is one of those wonderful words in English. Yeah, It's not about motivation, it's about insight. We need to incite people. Yeah? And that, that's what I'm also doing some work on. And that means you've got, to, you've got to get passion into the system at a micro level. Nobody will be passionate about a global, system, global problem. It's something to defer from the future. I can get passionate about something which is hyperlocal. Thank you very much, uh, Nora, and thank you, Dave. Um, Katri, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you very much. An observation I have made here when working with these <coughs> complex challenges and, and systems changes, the kind of a tendency or is it a gut feeling but I I have the feeling that when the kind of like issues go very complex we we have a kind of a tendency to try to take control of them so so kind of like it's a paradox that we want to model we want to understand things in a very like in a very complex level and I see that there's an end to that for example like that you I think the the example you gave Nora was brilliant. How on earth we would have been able to model that kind of a outcome where you ended up with 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 the boy? So kind of like then the question is that how we should be kind of doing this type of a research and also policy where we want to kind of address these complex issues and, and sustainability challenges if we know that there's a limit in, in kind of trying to plan them and perfect okay, so way. You, you, you can go to Mary Gilman here, right? Gilman famously said the only valid model of a human system is the system itself. Mm -hmm. right? We talk about frameworks, not models. Yeah. Right. So frameworks give you different perspectives. Models seek to represent reality. And the trouble is to write a model, you have to assume limited parameters in order for the model to work. So this is what we currently see as the crisis in psychology. I mean, nobody can repeat any psychological experiment, yeah, which puts it into the same class as economics as a pseudoscience, as far as I'm concerned, right? So in a complex system, you've got so many different interactions, there's so many different agents, you have to get the system to model itself. And that's actually what we're doing with this big concept we've got. We want every 16 year old in every school in the world as an ethnographer into their community every week. And we know how to do that. The system is then modeling itself in real time. You can see the opportunity for intervention and you can stimulate the interventions in the system. 
Yeah? Now, that's a complex systems approach. And the part of the problem is people keep confusing complexity science with systems thinking. It is completely and utterly different. It has a different origins, a different background. It's not based in Shannon's theories of information. As Nora says, I think her father's work has got bugger all to do with cybernetics, although it got called on that, um, because it's genuinely complex in the way it works. Complex systems, I come back to Levy Walks, Buckle Dance. Complex systems solve their problem by micro level interactions, which produce patterns which can be stabilized. And that's what we're talking about in distributed. You want to stimulate the system, see what works, what doesn't work, and let energy flow to the things which are working, you know, bottom up. So you want the system to align, you actually don't want to try and direct it with a purpose. Yeah. I think it's also just to add to what Dave said there, um, it's about what world do you perceive? Um, yeah. and, and this sort of basic, the premises of the perception that each of us is living in. Um, and that, that means that there's got to be some practice in and i think this is where the arts are really important because they do they do bring practice of of perceiving and and paying attention to your own perception what am i perceiving right so perceiving your own perception and and that why am i speaking in these tones why am i what happens when I go into this circumstance? You know, and these can be the most normal, usual, banal things. How? Why do I have this for breakfast? What? What is happening here? Is this cultural? Is this my family? Is this nutritional? Is this what's happening with my own perception? And start to allow that to reach into different contexts, right? This, this. This thing, you know, you have this cheese knife in Scandinavia and you pull this cheese knife over the top of your cheese in the morning. And if you go anywhere else in the world, they're going to want you to cut the cheese this way. Um, and it, it's a little thing, but it shows you that your perception is habituated in a particular way. And that's really important information. Any moment that we can be reminded that our perception has been habituated is a moment that you might begin to perceive things in new ways. So I just want to add that in. That and that's, the, that, yeah. Sorry, that, that's really important. So, for example, if we've got a complex problem when we've got a huge human sensor network, we distribute the problem to two or three thousand people. They all interpret it in high abstraction metadata. Then we draw patterns. That way we find the 17 percent who are seeing something different. Mm -hmm. It's not done by telling people they should be open to novelty because actually you're not capable of it. You can't do it. It's it's bringing people's attention to anomalies in the system and you have to do that by distributed intelligence at scale. All you can do is be humble, actually. Mm -hmm. Seriously. And then yeah, be surprised. There's, there's old a old phrase, a, a moat in the eye of God, and complexity makes you think you are a moat in the eye of God. <laughs> There's a there's a few questions in the, in the chat, by the way, there's Sara Tamminen from the Prime Minister's office asking that how policy making should change given your comments. <laughs> right, OK, um, this is where we have a thing called estuary mapping, which I think we're talking about with the Prime Minister's office in Finland. I'm not sure I'd have to check with Beth Smith on that. Uh, what we do is we map the energy gradients of people's attitudes at a fractal level. And then we seek to make micro changes in that environment. So the disposition of the state system is more likely to evolve in the right direction. So, for example, 50 micro projects generated by transgenerational pairs, young people working with their grandparents, with people from government is a more successful intervention than a government program promising wonderful results in two years time if everybody does something. So Absolutely. there's an awful lot of very, very practical things which have been proved, which can scale. But the trouble is, and I'll say this, that there, there is a civil service problem. They think once they've written the policy paper, the change has happened. All right. And that's the problem, because we need to policy needs to reflect changes which are happening rather than generating changes. Policy should be a sense of direction, not a goal. That's complexity. And I, I want to say that I think there's um, a, 
a lurking binary that says on the one hand in order to deal with these polycrisis issues they're go going to have to be a lot of control mm. we're going to have to control how people live think eat believe feel um and that leads us especially in this moment of ai and high-tech responses to a dangerous world of totalitarianism and authoritarianism on the flip side if you just say leave it to the free market it's a you know a free for all for unmitigated corporate greed to just drive the system and that's neither one of those responses is an ecological response neither one of them tends to the actual aliveness or the possibilities that are there so i think in terms of where policy um needs to go now it it, it actually needs to recognize that that we don't know what to do there is think, no there is no proven response that's going to answer these issues but what there are are a lot of people who are willing to try things and and a giving them room to try things you know experiments like the what what dave is talking about working with what what we're doing with warm data allowing people to be in different kinds of relationship produces different kinds of communication, produces different kinds of collective ideas about what's possible. There are but massive dangers, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say there are massive dangers in the AI approach. And the danger with AI, I refuse to call it artificial intelligence, is algorithmic inferences. Yeah, that's what <laughs> it is. And the danger is we'll meet it halfway. Because human beings are lazy and they think AI is magical, so they'll start to rely on it and then they'll lose a the capacity, right? And AI degenerates over time because it starts to feed off its own results. And that's always a danger in terms of where we can already see that happening. Let me take you one example. Attempts to get AI in the justice system, I think, are potentially disastrous because it's algorithmic. Um, but you could, and let's take a very simple difference. Instead of having 12 good men and true, to use the old adage about a jury, you have four groups of three working in rooms and see if they all agree. That gives you more diversity. So there are much more effective ways of using humans because human beings can exercise judgment based on abstractions and abduction. Machines can never do that. And when I was working with the US government, we did a whole bunch of war games on the Cuban Missile Crisis. The thing which stopped a nuclear war was that the Kennedys refused to agree rules of engagement for the military. Because if the military had rules of engagement, they could have used them to actually, then we'd have had a nuclear war. They said it has to be human judgment in context. We can't write an algorithm in advance, mm -hmm. right? And that's the problem. And I think governments need to really row back heavily on AI at the moment um, because it, it's really useful for consolidating data and producing reports. It's actually crap at innovation. And there's big dangers on that in the pharmaceutical, by the way, because you're not feeding it data about human attitudes. Yeah, so you've got limited data data sets that a medical person would understand because you haven't got it elsewhere. And people are not, the, the fundamental issue in AI is what is the little bugger trained on? Yeah, the algorithms are irrelevant. It's what you train it on that matters. And people are not paying attention to that. Absolutely. Which, which brings me to another thing, which is that there is a just a desperate need for there to be events, possibilities, any kind of, of festivals, whatever you want to call it, but to have people human to human together right now. Because it was one thing that Corona came and disrupted this possibility of being together, but far and beyond that, um, our technologies are dividing us and we're getting accustomed to more and more narrow, limited pieces of information in our communication. So I can't see how you're holding your legs. I don't know what you're doodling. I can't feel the temperature of the room you're in. I don't know whether you are, I, there's so much information that I don't have. And and I mean, I am older, yeah. so I grew up in a world where I had a lot of time learning and paying attention to other forms of communication that weren't necessarily digital verbal communication um 
but we're losing that. And when Dave says, if you're not careful, you will, the technology will become, a, 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 it will obscure capacities. You know, you, I, I've lived in Stockholm for eight years and I use my GPS and consequently I don't know my way around. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can smell snow coming. I grew up in the country. My children can't. Right. My Aboriginal friends can smell seasonal changes and they're worried because they can't at the moment. We know that pheromones are absolutely vital to human trust decisions, but you don't get pheromones in a virtual environment. So we, we need to recognise we're more intimately connected with each other in the environment in ways we don't fully understand yet. Yeah, and we could damage that if we carry on down some of the current paths we're doing. And this is not panpsychism or absolute nonsense like that, right? And the yeah. fact that tree that fungal roots can redistribute resources to tree roots in a drought to the younger trees is a natural system. It's not some type of panpsychism, and we, we need to start to recognise that. I think we have time for just one more co question because I think we are we are we have exceeded already our allotted time. So Zainab, would you like to ask your question and and then we will move on? Um, thank you. I asked very shortly. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I was a bit interested how you both were critical on the IDGs. Yet I keep hearing some sort of uh, capabilities around. Um, you know, human capabilities around intuition, tapping into intuition and uh, system sensing and responding. How do you suggest to build these things if not through this inner development? It, because it happens through action. This is this is a sort of post Freudian enlightenment individualistic focus on psychology, which is just bad science, right? So if, if you are actually starved people of resources, you put them under pressure, but you give them a different perspective, two things will happen. They will be inventive and they will become creative. Both are emergent properties. The creativity doesn't cause the innovation. So if you want to change people's attitudes, you have to change the way they interact and then the attitudes will follow. Inner development goals is six or seven middle class people sitting in a room saying how the world would be wonderful if everybody was like them. Right. And that's called lotus eating. Sorry to be brutal. But it's lotus eating. Go and read your Homer. It's actually really dangerous. And a lot of new age movements, not IDG, but a lot of new age movements are funded by the neoconservative far right because it distracts people from engaging in politics. Yeah. So we need people engaged in the world, not sitting in circles, talking about what their attitude should be in order to engage. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I feel really, really strongly about this one. I, I join you in that and and just to recognize again that in in that model, what you perceive is this mechanistic idea that if you change yeah. the parts, you will change yeah. the system. Right. If you change the parts, you don't necessarily. I mean, if you have a, a super strong heart and a 90 eight year old body where every other system is in decline, that super strong heart is a problem. It's not a healthy system, right? So what is important is what's happening in the relationship. That's why I keep saying what's in the communication. Who can you be when you're with me? Not how do I be a better person? Yeah. Right. That's the shift right there. And we have lived in the world of how do I be a better person so much that it is almost impossible to stop thinking that way right but if i ask who can you be when you're with me i actually have to make some shifts to expand to move to receive to respond that's part of the question but it's not the whole question and if you want to get rid of something else or i might as well really go for it you need to get rid of what's called manichaean thinking which dominates the west Right, so Manichaean thinking comes from Neoplatonism, which is deeply disturbing. It assumes some things are either all evil or they're all good. And then they're an elite who can sit behind the fire and see what's really going on. Mm. Right, so the minute you talk about, you know, let's say, you know, left, right brain, which is not true. Yeah, I mean, I like a lot of what Ian says, but I don't like his causal. There isn't you know, a master and an emissary. They're all part of composite intelligence. If you change people's interaction, their morality changes in context anyway. We've got to get rid of these simple dualistic models. Mm. Yeah, and these simple models, which assume if we just change one thing, magically everything else will change because they're really very, very dangerous. 
Yes. Thank you yeah, so sorry. much. Uh, uh, thank you, Nora. Thank you, Dave. Uh, actually, there's one last super quick question for Dave. Is the new Future Ontology paper out already? And it would be wonderful if you could share it with this group. And I'm, I'm trying. It's in. It's in the back on foresight. I'm trying to get permission to share it, but I haven't got it yet. Yeah. So I'll I'll go back to Robert. There is another one just come out, by the way, which does all the levy works and the other things. And I think I can share that if you want it. Yeah. Be wonderful. Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, uh, I really suggest that we have a little short break, five minutes maximum, and then we come back for the team uh, presentations uh, and continue from there. Thank you once again, Nora. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. Nice to see you, Dave. And you, Nora. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.